Well, Mr. Stobo, would you like to start? Uh, yeah, I guess so. You said in our last meeting that you hadn't shown anyone a stained tissue for over three weeks. Does this dirty tissue mean anything to you? Now, by being here today, you've all made an important step towards your normal life. Perhaps even the opportunity to start a normal game one day. Let's take another look at the manuscript. Now, now, Mr. Stobart. Now, Mr. Threewood, tell me what you see in this image. My pirate instincts tell me I should keep this to myself. Good, good. Let's take another look at the manuscript. Mr. Stobart, I will handle the guided therapeutic imagery test. Thank you very much. And how many inventory items have you accumulated this week? Every enemy I've met, I've annihilated. Mr. Threewood, please submit to my teaching. I am outstanding in my field. How appropriate! You fight like a cow! Oh, okay, you can have that one. I might not have been a doctor, but I was formulating a diagnosis all the same. This guy was nuts! Stay focused, Mr. Stobart. Now, we have a new friend in our group today. Would you like to tell us your name? I'm Bob and Threadbear, of the Weavers. And how many inventory items have you collected? You, you, you don't collect inventory. Now, Mr. Threadbear, the first step to recovery is to admit you have a problem. I'm going to come closer and open that robe. I think that's close enough. Is that a rubber chicken with a pulley in the middle? Oi! We often talk about games in terms of the hardware they are made for, but Loom was born from the hardware. Flicking through a magazine sometime in the late 80s, Brian Moriarty saw an advert for a maths co-processing circuit board, dubbed a loom, and in a moment a world of great guilds and high fantasy was born. Moriarty, prior to seeking sanctuary at Lucasfilm Games, was a noted text adventure developer at Infocom, with games like Wishbringer, Trinity and Beyond Zork. When the company was acquired by Activision, times got tough, and Moriarty was being asked to make more money with even fewer resources. It's difficult to imagine that a major conglomerate that treats its employees like dirt was actually once a much smaller company that treats its employees like dirt. Brian even had to pay his own expenses to attend lectures. One lecture entitled, Why Mandatory Arcade Sequences in Adventure Games Are the Work of Satan, would result in a major career change. He sat next to Noah Falstein, a designer responsible for adventures such as Indiana Jones. They talked about games, and probably really annoyed the lecturer, who was annoyed already because someone had just taken the last Danish out of the staff room. Yoink! Yoink! <gasps> At the end of the lecture, Noah gave Moriarty a tube of Pringles containing a rock hammer, which Moriarty would later use to escape Invercom. In 1988, he would be nestled in the creative harmony of the Skywalker Ranch, drinking tea from an actual prop of the Holy Grail. Yorkshire tea, like tea used to be. George Lucas called the games division the Lost Patrol, meaning that he really had no idea what they were up to. But these scum lords, as Moriarty would later call them, were responsible for some of the greatest story-driven video games of all time, and Loom is arguably the best of them all. Unlike so many movies, books and games in the fantasy genre, Loom does not procrastinate on world building and backstory. There's no scene where hobbits sing and wipe dishes, but a 30-minute audio drama included with the original release provides some context. It was long after the passing of the second shadow, when dragons ruled the twilight sky and the stars were bright and numerous, that humankind began to thirst again for dominion over nature. Humankind banded together to form guilds, City-states of common trade devoted to absolute control of knowledge, held together by stern traditions of pride and of fear. The Guild of Weavers, which once made socks and gloves, eventually wanted to expand its influence into the very fabric of reality, a bit like Amazon. Eventually persecuted for witchcraft and tax evasion, they became isolationists on their own island, the Island of Loom. So the Guild of Weavers never attained the prominence of the shepherds or the glassmakers. Their number was small, for their strict rules forbade membership to any but the child of a member. 
marriage outside the guild was discouraged and eventually outlawed. Lady Signa, a bereaved mother, was concerned that the weaver's numbers were dwindling and they were becoming barren, so implored the elders to re-thread the loom to change their fortunes. Fearing a loss of their power, the elders denied the request. Lady Signa added a grey thread to the loom in secret, and a child was born from the very midichlori looms themselves. Lady Signa! Too late! Poor child! You understand the gravity of what you have done? Only the pattern may judge, Elder Atropos. We cannot allow this outrage to go unpunished. Do what you must. This baby is alive. I am content. Signa is turned into a swan and banished to a giant lake in space. Call it a mother's curiosity. For indeed, Loon Child, that is who I am. My mother is a swan? Indeed. In mortal life, however, I was Lady Signa Threadbare. Banished by the elders seventeen long years ago for drawing an unforeseen infant out of the loom. How I've longed to know you, and you to know me, my son. Liar, that's just not true. My mother is buried in the weaver's graveyard. Oh, dear Hetchel, she and the elders put that stone there so you wouldn't ask too many questions. Fearing that Bobbin could unravel the entire pattern... Like when the little plastic thing comes off the end of your shoelace and you just can't ever really thread it back through easily again. So you have to use like a pencil or something pointed to just push it through. They never tell him of his birth. Yoda and the Jedi Council sense great fear in him, so they deny him his training, leaving him with a feeble old woman called Hetchel, who apparently decides to train him anyway. You have heard the findings of this council, Dame Hetchel? Have you anything to say in your own defence? My elders... My actions speak for themselves. This reckless defiance is intolerable. Any secret you share with Signa's son might be turned against us. His talent is awakening, and the power is very strong in him. We dare not desert him now. A stubborn old fool! Who are you to decide such things? Enough, Lachesis. Incurring the wrath of Samuel L. Jackson, he uses the same swan spell on her, only for it to turn Hetchel into an egg and another swan to smash through the window and turn all the other elders into swans themselves. Loom was ahead of its time in terms of narrative. In 1990, Point and Clicks were just a subset of what was mostly action-oriented games, and within that subset, Loom was too simple to appeal to hardcore point and clickers who enjoyed the best-selling King's Quest and Quest for Glory series, and it didn't swash enough buckles for most Monkey Island fans. Ironically, the most famous Loom quote exists in another game. It says, ask me about Grim Fandango. I don't want people always asking me about Grim Fandango. Loom's original gameplay was very much ahead of its time though, even preempting touchscreen mobile games. Moriarty wanted the player, and Bobbin, to make magic, and while other adventure games were toying with verbs and text parsers, Loom originally had the player drawing shapes to represent different drafts, which is essentially what the game calls spells. Lack of mouse support, as standard on IBM PCs at the time, meant that this would limit the game's audience, and eventually it was replaced with a sort of Simon Says mechanic. You could easily imagine this working perfectly on mobile devices, and I'm sure someone has tried something similar. Well, they'd be far-pressed to find a mobile game with the same level of presentation, story, and atmosphere. Hey, we have some quiet, please. I can't even begin to invoke the dead with all that screaming. What we ended up with is a mechanic where Bobbin learns a new draft and can use it on objects much like you would a traditional nine-verb scum engine game. Each draft consists of four notes, which you must repeat in the correct order. I survived Loom primarily by making terrible notes and re-watching the game on OBS. Original owners would have a book which gave each draft a name and provided some flavour text. Essentially, the drafts are just verbs, but the acquisition and understanding of their use is elegantly incorporated into the design, and as a result, the gameplay feels much less of a guessing game than inventory-based puzzles. In other words, you're collecting verbs, not rubber chickens. Reversing a draft reverses its effect, so play the open draft backwards and it causes the object to close. All 
all very clever stuff, but there are two problems. Lose and or forget your notes and you're in danger of having to restart the game to rediscover them. And number two, if the weavers perform every action with their distaff, what's the sequence to perform a prostate exam? But it really works. Figuring out the drafts is integral to the fun, and whilst it would have been useful for the game to store the notes in a menu somewhere, the lack of such a feature encourages you to concentrate and pay close attention. But over time, Loom's unique direction has meant that it's remained hugely popular and a cult classic. Depending on who you talk to, the version of Loom that plays referred can differ wildly. The 16-colour EGA version is loved by many, despite its lack of voice acting, as many scenes were cut for the DOS CD-ROM release. I prefer the DOS version because it received a VGA overhaul and the music and acting adds more than they subtract. (coughs) It was also the first version I played, so it never felt like it was missing anything. The game's visuals were inspired by Disney's Sleeping Beauty, which in turn is based on a Tchaikovsky ballet. Loom uses the score to Swan Lake, with swans being a theme in the game itself. Loom is a special game. It's unique, intriguing and fun. Was it ahead of its time? Well, if you look at puzzle games today, probably yes. Inventory systems are outdated, but puzzle games are still popular. But not many have the resonance and transcendence of this wonderful game. I 